Hi, my name is John Fomenta, I'm an instructor here at ProCept Associates. And in this video, we're going to talk about process analysis. So process analysis is one of the new techniques identified in BABOC version 3 and in its BABOC section 1034. So the first thing to remember about process analysis is how it differs from process modeling. As business analysts, we're very familiar with creating models of processes so that we can implement new solutions for our stakeholders or creating models of uh, the current state of, of a process or something like that. But process analysis takes this idea one step further. We're not just trying to model the process, but we're actually trying to analyze it and ultimately to improve that process. So that improvement could involve eliminating some gaps. It could involve improving the effectiveness of the process. So how well is the process meeting its goals or meeting its objectives? Or the efficiency of the process? How quickly is it meeting those goals? Uh, with how many resources it's using to meet those goals? So those are things that we might measure in terms of effectiveness. Uh, and then finally, defects. So defects, I think, is a really important area when we talk about analyzing a process. So how often is the process successful? Do we produce things that uh, the customer of the process doesn't accept or that we have to rework or scrap or redo? Uh, these are also very important measures for the analysis of the process. So process analysis is not an activity that is unique to business analysis. And we see it also involved in some other methodologies that we tend to associate maybe a little bit more with quality. So Six Sigma methodology, Lean methodology, and business analysis all sort of have this overlap, which is process analysis, right? All three of those methodologies are all concerned with analyzing processes and improving them. Because those other methodologies are also performing process analysis, what we actually do in business analysis is kind of borrow their techniques, right? We're going to make use of good techniques from those other methodologies. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So let's see the techniques that we're going to borrow from these other methodologies. So we're going to start with SIPOC. So SIPOC is a Six Sigma methodology technique. And SIPOC actually is an acronym and stands for Supplier, Input, Process, Output, and customer, so SIPOC are those five letters. What SIPOC really allows us to do is to define processes very well. So as we go through this uh, SIPOC definition, you know, who are the suppliers of the process? So who are the people, the organizations, the partners, the companies, you know, whoever it might be that are providing inputs into our process. So we would identify them as suppliers to the process. What inputs do they provide? So what are the things that we need to get this process started or that come you know, into the process? And so those could be materials, it could be information, it could be you know, work in pro progress, it could be a transaction, you know, any, it could be really any physical or, or information that goes into making this process happen. So what are the, the inputs? Obviously, those inputs are provided by the suppliers. Next one is the process. So what are the actual steps? What do we actually do in this process uh, in order to produce the outputs? All right, is letter O. Uh, what do we produce? Uh, are, there, are there documents? Are there transactions? Are there finished goods? Are there, is it you know, another work in progress assembly or something like that? What do we produce at the output of this process? And then who are the customers of our process? So again, what people parties, organizations, companies uh, are making use of those outputs. So I think it's important at this point to mention, you know, supplier and customer. These are supplier and customer from the perspective of the process itself, right? Suppliers to the process, customers of the process. Don't, this might actually be, you know, the big C customer of, the, of our company and in terms of we're actually producing a finished good that we're providing to them. But it could also be, you know, an internal customer, right? So as, let's say I'm an employee, uh, I'm the customer of the employee expense process because, you know, I want to get paid. <laughs> I want to get my expenses paid at the end of that process. That makes me a customer of that process. Similarly with, similarly with suppliers, these could be internal suppliers or external 
for suppliers. They're not necessarily that you know capital S supplier organization that's providing things to to our company. So the power of SIPOC really is to define processes and especially to define the boundaries of processes. Oftentimes when we're doing process analysis, you know, our stakeholders will have an idea, oh yeah, we have a process and such and such is the name of the, of the process. Uh, however, they don't necessarily have the same understanding of the boundary of that process, the scope. When does the process begin? When does the process end? So by defining our, our SIPOC as we've done here, it's a very simple, very straightforward, and very quick thing for us to do. But it creates a lot of clarity around the boundaries of that process because it's pretty clear. It says, well, it starts with you know these certain inputs. If somebody had a different idea of, of the scope of that process, oh, they thought it was larger or smaller, that's going to be pretty evident when we show them or, or work to elicit and develop this SIPOC definition. So very powerful tool for process analysis, especially in the early stages, is SIPOC from Six Sigma. I'm going to take a little break from the techniques here to talk about the role of feedback within process analysis. So feedback plays a key role in accomplishing process goals in terms of being effective, reducing defects, and so on. Uh, if you're, if you think about engineering, if you think about products, you know all of our products that we use, or the majority of them, have some kind of feedback mechanism. You know, your car has a speedometer so that you can see how fast you're going. You know, within that vehicle, there's all kinds of sensors that are telling the, the transmission what's happening, the, you know, all of the internal uh, functions within that product and any other product that you think about. There's always a feedback mechanism, right? Engineers understand this very clearly. It's, it's not enough to try to produce an output. We want to measure and ensure that we actually are producing it. However, in the business world, we don't always see this with our business processes, right? There are a lot of business processes you'll encounter where, oh yeah, we're just producing and producing and producing and producing, but we're not necessarily looking at what we've produced or communicating about what we've produced to see that it's actually you know, met the goals of what we're trying to do. Uh, and that's where feedback can be very important. So when you're analyzing your process, you know, look for that feedback mechanism. How do we know that what we produced is actually what, uh, what the customer was looking for? So as I say here, you know, processes without systemic feedback usually don't perform very well. When we talk about efficiency, we're comparing the value of our outputs versus the value of our inputs. This could be resources, dollars, time, uh, you know, all of these different measures that we can look at, right? But, you know, what are we producing versus what we put in, right? Obviously, we want to produce more than what we put in. Um, how, how do those two things compare? So that's kind of a measure of, of Efficiency and efficiency is a primary concern for lean methodologies. So lean, the name lean comes from the idea that we don't have a lot of waste in our processes. Uh, so we're going to look at a technique for lean, which is value stream mapping. So value stream mapping is a tool to help us, you know, identify and eliminate waste and to be more efficient. And when you first see a value stream map, it can be very intimidating, right? There's just uh, a lot of information there. There's a lot of different icons. There's some weird and wacky shaped icons. Uh, there's a lot going on in there and there is a reason for that. The reason is that a value stream map actually contains four types of information. There's four types of information within that single model which uh, from my perspective and experience is kind of a record because if you think about you know business process model it might tell you the actors, it tells you the process steps, maybe if you're lucky it tells you some data or something like that. You know, that's two or three dimensions, but a value stream map, you know, at four dimensions, that's pretty high in terms of complexity. So let's break this down and look at the four aspects of a value stream map. The first one is just a simple process flow. So as you can see here, I chose a kind of a simple example here, four steps in the process. We can see, you know, who asked for this, what are the steps that, that we go through. Uh, and this is pretty easy to read. It does tell you there are some specific icons that uh, go from one process step to another that tell you how that material or how the outputs are, are conveyed, uh, which could be you know, by push or by pull or some different kind of methods there. But in general, you know, it's pretty easy to see. Okay, there's four steps here. Uh, the next thing that we're going to add to our value stream map is actually the flow of information. So lean methodologies are very, very concerned with the flow of information, the 
flow of communication, especially as it relates to uh, the control of work. So what are, what are the signals, what is the information that causes work to occur that dictates and guides actors within the process to go ahead and complete work. So information flow is the second thing that we're going to record in our value stream map. So you can see now it's starting to get a little bit more complicated. And now we're going to add the third element, which is the actual process data. So it's not now we're not just talking about a map, right? We're not just describing how things are structured and what the steps are and how information flows, but we're actually talking about how does this process perform. So we're going to add information like the cycle time of the various steps. We could add you know, defect rates. There's not really some clear rules on, on what we add in terms of information. It's kind of what information is relevant to that process. So cycle times, defects, you know, the number of people working in that area, variability of that process, you know, all kinds of information like that could be added in. Uh, what is the inventory? So as we complete things, you know, uh, inventory we tend to think in a physical way, but in the transactional way, you know, how many um, expenses are waiting to be approved, right? That's, that's a number that we should be able to get on average. Uh, and that's kind of like a transactional inventory, right? So we're going to add into our value stream map all this process data that describes how the process is actually performing. And then our final step, uh, way out here now, is we actually use the value stream map to do strategic planning. So we're going to create a current state value stream map, and we're going to create a future state value stream map. And now on that future state value stream map, we're going to identify with these kind of yellow bars that you see in the diagram here, what are the improvement activities that we need to perform, so like, kind of like the projects or events, how we're going to go about this, but what are the improvement activities that we're going to perform to move us from the current state to the future state value stream map? And in a lean environment, we really want to be visual. So these things are probably going to be on the wall, right? Here's the current state, here's the future state, and that future state also shows us these little bursts of how we're going to get there. So I hope this uh, clarifies a little bit about the value stream map in terms of the four components to it, the process, the flow of information, the process data in terms of its performance, and also these kind of strategic planning element of how are we going to improve process. So that's why it becomes such a big, complex, messy diagram. Uh, it's because it has those kind of four pieces of information. Once again, this is Jonathan Nittuck with Process Associates. If you have any questions about this content or if you're interested in some training, please visit our website to see a list of uh, courses that we have available. And I hope you enjoyed this segment on process analysis.